And now a uh, lifetime subscriber to the Oakland A's and a great, great artist, Dr. John Adams. Thank you. President Polisi and Dean Guzalamian are Yankees fans, so that was a very low blow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I have one message for the graduating class. No texting during my speech. <laughs> Every time I come to uh, Juilliard, they always manage me one way or another to uh, end up at a podium. So here I am again. Um, I've been asked to make these remarks, brilliant, knowledgeable, inspiring, and brief. Uh, so I, I won't take any repeats during the scherzo. Um, <clears throat> I have to say that, that being a composer invited into a public gathering is always an anxiety-producing experience. No matter how casual or at ease we composers may appear to be on the outside, there's always a little homunculus sitting on our shoulders, muttering cryptic and often insulting remarks and reminding us that no matter how much we've composed or no matter how grand the honor we may be receiving, you'll never be as good as Bach. <laughs> Things, things have loosened up and, and changed in a very positive way for composers in the years since I was uh, in school. Um, back then, when I first started going to co concerts, a, a distinguished composer in the audience was relatively easy to identify. You, you just look for a very serious middle-aged person, usually male, uh, and usually resembling a college math professor who had misplaced his glasses. He'd be the one who had been born on a bad hair day <laughs> and who wore a wrinkled shirt that hadn't known an iron in several years. He'd be the one who uh, composed using a hardware device called a pencil um, and who carried around his latest composition, probably titled something like Confrontations for, for Soprano, Double Bass, Piano, and Magnetic Tape. Uh, <laughs> In a, in a huge oversized briefcase. <laughs> Nowadays, composers look decidedly more hip. Um, the male of the species doesn't compose 12-tone music anymore. He's, he's more likely to have written a piece. Uh, <laughs> he's more likely to have written a piece for percussion ensemble and laptop uh, <laughs> based on his favorite hip-hop artist, and has heard it performed on a Bang on the Can Marathon concert. <clears throat> and instead of a dog-eared manuscript in a leather briefcase, his composition is entirely contained on a single memory stick that he carries in his shirt pocket. And although he's nearing 40 and uh, just has the beginnings of a receding hairline, he's dressed like Justin Bieber uh, <laughs> with red high tops, a leather jacket, and a baseball bat, a, a baseball cap, uh, <laughs> with a bill pointed backwards, of course. But the best thing about the change in new music since I was a student is that now the world is full of very exciting young women composers, many of whom have genuinely transformed the musical landscape with their talent, their wit, and their imagination. You can spot one of these young women composers in the crowd because she's likely to be the one wearing a thrift store retro chiffon dress, fishnet stockings, and her great aunt's pendant earrings. She'll be the one with the killer web page and uh, who has an upcoming gig at Le Poisson Rouge. And if you look really carefully, you'll notice that on her left shoulder, she's got a tattoo that says, Morton Feldman rocks. <laughs> It's the month of May, and people like me who've been asked to speak at college commencements are feverishly thumbing through their copies of Bartlett's quotations or searching Wikipedia for some golden little nuggets of wisdom or humorous anecdotes with which to begin their speeches. 
I see that while we're gathered here, just a few miles north, Ariana Huffington is uh, sharing her philosophy and savvy career tips with the graduating class of Sarah Lawrence. When I graduated from college in 1969, the Vietnam War was raging, and a good 20% of my classmates had already burned their draft cards and had adopted the classic John Lennon hairstyle, mustache, and granny glasses look. At my own commencement ceremony, several protesting students tried to take over the podium and had to be removed by class marshals. Times are less violent now, at least within the country, but the world that awaits you is no less volatile and no less unpredictable. I should be doing the ritual thing and blessing you with words of wisdom and encouragement, and I, I will. But the truth is, all I really want to do is thank you. Thank all of you students who, against all odds and against all the pressures to do otherwise, have chosen a life in the arts. All the paradigms of success that we routinely encounter in our everyday lives, on television, in movies, in the online world, in the constant din of advertising, even from our friends and families, all these models for success and happiness, American style, are really about what is ultimately a disposable life, about a life centered around material gain and about finding the best possible comfort zone for yourself. But you, by choosing a career and a life in the arts, you've set yourselves apart from all of that and from a nation that has become such a hostage to distraction that it can't absorb a single complex thought without having it first reduced to a soundbite. Most people now, and particularly most people your age, live in a fractured virtual environment where staying focused for a single thought for, say, a mere seven seconds presents a grave challenge. I mention seven seconds because a staff researcher at Google in San Francisco recently told me that 7.3 seconds was the amount of time that an average viewer stayed on a YouTube site before jumping to another page. You've grown up in a world that offers constant, almost irresistible distraction, not unlike what the serpent in the Garden of Eden offered Eve when he whispered in her ear, check out them apples. <laughs> the arts, however, are difficult. They are mind-bendingly and refreshingly difficult. You can't learn the role of Hamlet, no less write it. And you can't play the Hammerklavier Sonata, no less compose it. And you can't hope to move effortlessly through one of Twyla Tharp's ballets without having submitted yourself to something that's profoundly difficult, that demands sustained concentration and devotion. Artists are people who've learned how to surrender themselves to a higher purpose, to something better than their miserable little egos. They've been willing to put their self-esteem in a Cuisinart and let it be chopped and diced and crushed to a pulp. <laughs> They're the ones who've learned to live with the brutal fact that God didn't dole out talent in fair and equal portions, and that the person sitting right next to them may only need to practice half as hard to win the concerto competition. And the wonderful, astonishing thing about the arts is that they're utterly useless. <laughs> you can't eat music or poetry or dance. You can't drive your car on a sonnet. You can't wear it on your back to shield you from the elements. This uselessness is why politicians and other painfully literal-minded people during times of budget crisis, which is pretty much all the time now, can't wait to single out the arts for elimination. Take away uh, tax benefits from oil corporations? No way. Eliminate the uh, National Endowment for the Arts? I, I think that's a good starting point. <laughs> yeah. These people consider that what we as artists do 
can honestly be compared to the real business of life. That art is really entertainment and ultimately non-essential. They don't realize that what we offer is one of the few things that makes human life meaningful. That through our skill and our talent and through the way that we share our rich emotional lives, we add color and texture and depth and complexity to their lives. A life in the arts means a life of sacrifice and tens of thousands of hours of devotion and discipline with scant remuneration and I'm sorry to say, as is often the case, scant recognition. A life in the arts means loving complexity and ambiguity. It means enjoying the fact that there are no single absolute solutions. And it means that you value communicating about matters of the spirit over the baser forms of human interaction. Because you know that life is not just a transaction. That it's not simply a game about winning someone's confidence purely for purposes of material gain. By coming to Juilliard, by going through the scary audition process and sweating out your first recital, by losing sleep over some offhand cranky comment by your teacher, <laughs> you showed that you wanted to take a different route. So I'm deeply grateful for your decision. And I know, even without asking them, that all of the honorees here sitting on the stage with me feel the same way. I often say that when a young composer shows me a score, what I'm looking for is to be surprised. Because surprise wakes me up to the world. Surprise makes me see something or feel something in a way I've never before expected. Nowadays, with all the arts so instantly available via technology, we're finding it even ever more difficult to be surprised by something. We can hear or see just about anything online now, but how often are we bowled over, been forced to stop all other discursive mind wandering and just sit there in astonishment, listening or looking in rapt amazement? What does it take to move us from our customary place? And by the way, that's what the word ecstasy literally means. It's from the Greek, which means to be moved out of one's place. And that is what we want when we confront a work of art. We want to be moved out of our place. There, there's some lines from a Louise Erdrich poem that I'm currently setting that say it right. I will drive boys to smash empty bottles on their brows. I will pull them right out of their skins. And that's the kind of intensity we want in the artistic experience. We want you to pull us right out of our skins. In order to achieve that element of surprise, you have to set up expectation. The quality of surprise depends on how carefully, how knowingly these expectations have been set up. And whether you're a master playwright or a subtle and probing leader singer or a speed of light jazz improviser, your expertise in setting up expectations depends on two factors that would at first seem to be contradictory. One is supreme technical mastery. Mastery of a kind that is so secure and so thoroughly internalized that it functions at an almost subliminal level. And look at these three people on the stage here and think that's the kind of technique that you want. And the other is having a gift for the outrageous. Look at them again. <laughs> having the willingness and readiness to make that sudden, spontaneous departure from the norm. Does this sound like a Herbie Hancock piece? The ability to, to depart from the script and make the unexpected leap out of the box, to do it precisely when it's least expected. Such a gift is impossible to teach. It has to come from the core of the artist's personality. I remember hearing Yo-Yo Ma play one of the, uh, the Bach uh, sonatas for cello and keyboard, and it was the first time that I'd ever heard Yo-Yo play live. And, uh, I remember thinking to myself, well, he's a superstar, so it'll be note perfect, and I'll be dazzled by his technique, and he'll look great, but I won't expect any revelations. 
But just the opposite happened. My reaction to Yo-Yo's Bach was, man, that was weird. <laughs> he didn't play Bach at all the way I'd come to think I'd known it. He was not afraid to be coarse and edgy at times, and nor was he afraid to go beyond the accepted norms of polite expressiveness that we'd been admonished to consider was the way you did Bach. He'd obviously asked very deep questions of himself before he considered this piece. So, if I can leave you with some words of wisdom, uh, you hear the coda coming here. <laughs> We've reached the tonic. <laughs> and I don't know what Ariana Huffington's saying right, right now at this point in her speech. <laughs> Probably, don't, tell, don't sell your technology stocks. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably would urge you to do one thing above all else, and that's never to consider yourself sufficiently educated. Always remember to adopt Zen beginner's mind. If you're playing or dancing or acting something for the umpteenth time, stop and ask yourself, how can I make it fresh? What have I been missing in this? How can I avoid going on autopilot? And don't be afraid to take baby steps. Simon Rattle was already a world famous conductor nearing the peak of his professional achievement when he went off to study and literally sit at the feet of Nicholas Harnoncourt. During his last year of life, Schubert sought out a counterpoint teacher, took lessons. And we all know, of course, about Stravinsky, how he painstakingly, throughout his life, learned completely new and unfamiliar techniques, even at an advanced age. And we know how what he absorbed gave new life and energy to every phase of his creative life. Be bold. Be humble. Don't mind being difficult. And don't ever feel that what you're doing in this attention deficit disorder country of ours is marginal or unimportant. You are, in fact, the heart and the soul of its very being. Thank you.